أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا والشفيع نفوسنا حبيب الله العالمين ولا حبيب إلا هو وأحله الذي سمع في السماء بأحمد وفي العرض بأب القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وأهله الطيبين الطاهرين Like you all know, we are approaching the beginning of the month of the Hajja, which is amongst the most sacred months in the Islamic calendar, with particular emphasis on the first 10 days of this month leading up to the day of Arafah on the 9th of the Hajja, as well as the Eid of Eid al-Adha on the 10th. But before I get into speaking to some of its merits and sharing some quick thoughts and reflections about how we can hopefully utilize these days as a spiritual inspiration or reformation uh, over the next week or so. I wanted to talk a little bit about this term that we often throw around these days uh, known as presence. When I say the word presence, to be present at something, what does that mean to people? What is the first thought that comes to your mind? Maybe one or two people want to jump in. <laughs> We say it fairly often. You should be present in your job. You should be present at this moment. You should be present in your prayers. You should be present with your family. What does it mean to be present? To know that you exist in this world. That's what I would say. Okay. How could we make that more tangible or specific to a particular relationship or a particular moment? Yeah. Be able to clear your mind and focus on a task. To be able to clear your mind and focus on a task. Okay, good. Yeah. Be mindful and give people their due attention. If you're with somebody, yeah. Not being distracted. Not being distracted, right? I think that we have this principle as well within our hadith literature known as hudur al qalb, fissarat, mathalan, that to have a presence of heart uh, during the course of prayers, right? to isolate all distractions, to be totally and completely mindful of that conversation or that moment that you're in, in intimacy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for instance. And sometimes, or what we you know, attend to, or what we desire truly, when we talk about this sort of notion of ethical or spiritual presence, is to completely eradicate any distraction in that moment between us and God. And truly, like, 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 like was mentioned before, in the big picture of things is to be present with ourselves, understand who we are, understand our potentials, understand our roles and responsibilities during our time in this world, and recognize that I am a physical being as much as I'm a spiritual being, and that I have to traverse through all of the pathways in this dunya, which is filled with, uh, you know, a whole host of obstacles and tribulations such that I'm able to reach my ultimate destination, which is God, right? To know myself and to know God. Sometimes we become so present with things that are the distraction that we forget that which we should be present for in the first place. You follow what I'm saying? I'll give you an example. I wasn't planning on sharing this example. It's pretty embarrassing, actually. <laughs> Uh, yesterday was my daughter's first day of uh, my daughter's is both first day of summer camp, summer, you know, programming now that school is out. And it was the first day that my older daughter started taking the bus to school. Normally she would walk to school and close by and for whatever reason we opted to send her on the bus. And I'm not used to this bus schedule. And I was in a meeting with somebody and truly trying to do my very best in my work, which is to be present in the midst of that conversation that I'm having with this woman on the opposite side of my computer screen. And as she's talking to me about her family and talking to me about her life and talking to me about all of the challenges that she's undergoing currently, I realized that it was the time for me to pick up my daughter. And I told her, I'm really sorry. I completely forgot and just step away to the you know, tragic reality that by the time I got out of my house and ran to the bus stop, on the second day of school, my seven-year-old daughter saw the bus drive by, meaning I missed her pickup, knowing very well that the bus would probably come back 30 seconds later, waiting you know, to drop off this kid. 
I got ran to the next stop. I got my daughter falling out tears. She said, Baba, you forgot me. What happened? I said, I'm sorry. I was really present with somebody <laughs> at that moment. I needed to be present also as a father and to fulfill my other responsibility. At the end of the day, I say that sometimes we get so caught up in a thing, in a moment, in a job, in a relationship, in a meal, in a cup of coffee, in something that is so distracting that takes us away from our ultimate purpose in this world, which is again to expose ourselves, growth, to know who our creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. We have potential and we have the ability to be a being that is very transformative, that leave behind some unique, incredible legacy for our akhara. But it all starts with us understanding, like was mentioned before, what our ability is, what our potential is, why we're here, where we, came, where we came from. Why is it that I live today and I don't live 100 years ago? Why is it that I live today and not 100 years from now? There are reasons for these. And we have to reflect upon these questions every time and time again. It's much easier for me to think about, you know, what I'm going to eat for breakfast tomorrow in comparison with, you know, why did God create me? You know, who wants to think about a question like that? Sometimes it's just too heavy. You can't sleep at night. So I might as well go to sleep thinking about what I'm going to have for breakfast tomorrow because that just makes more sense. Every so often, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with this fitrah, this innate nature to know him, to be exposed to his light, azzawajal, we have these tendencies whereby we become a little bit more self-reflective. During the month of Ramadan, we you know, engage in these conversations and we engage in these existential questions more than other times throughout the year, right? It's, 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 it's almost normal. It's almost natural because we are tiring our bodies out by fasting in the day and by praying at the night. So all of a sudden things that are really, really important to us, they get centered and we're able to pursue them and move forward. But then every so often, again, we get bound with the shackles of the distractions of this dunya. God says numerous times in the Quran that don't get deceived. This is all a big game, right? This world is a play. This world is a deviation from that which is the most important. But you got to navigate it, right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us intrinsically to have to deal with it, right? Because at the end of the day, it is this, it is this trial and tribulation for us that he examines us via. So when we talk about the utilization of these nights and days of this month that is approaching us, it's important that we utilize it as an opportunity to recalibrate that presence that we should be having during the course of our lives. To once again, to see God, to open up our heart, rethink, reopen up those existential questions and ask ourselves, why am I here? Why was I created? What is my purpose? You might've asked that question in Ramadan. You might've asked it last month. You might've asked it last week, but to think about it again in a new light, because we have this principle known as sacred space. It's a term that's often thrown around in the religious studies. Anyone know what sacred space means? The only nerd. Sacred space, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did put in the email, that's right. Like those times and places. Yeah. Like the somebody reads our emails. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the proximity to God is, is closer. We feel like it's easier to become conscious. Yeah, right. So there's times, like you said, places, locations. The month of Ramadan is one of them. You know, the Holy Kaaba is one of them. We believe in sort of physical, you know, tangible places. In some schools of Islamic law, it's recommended that at the time of al ihtidhar at the last moment of someone's life if possible, to place them in the room where they would normally say their prayers, because that's their moment where they have historically been most connected to, uh, to God. So place them in that room because that transition between this world and the next world will be easier, because again, that location physically is a reminder of, of God. Or a prayer mat that we put down on the ground. Why do we do that? It's good that every family member, for instance, has their own prayer mat, right? Because that identifies or it symbolically connects them, you know, to 
to, uh, to the creator or to ritualistic acts of worship and so on. So these days that are approaching us, again, is that opportunity once again, out of God's grace, out of his mercy, out of his generosity that he says that I'm unveiling to you these days as a new opportunity for you to revitalize this heart of yours, to reestablish that sense of presence that again might have been deviated um, via all of these distractions of the world that we often go through. Before I share a hadith that I want to speak about briefly for this evening. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks about the heart in three different ways. The first type of, or he speaks about three different types of hearts. And I'll, and I'll mention this as well. That whenever God mentions the heart within the Quran, he's not talking about the physical organ, right? The heart. He's talking about a spiritual entity, a spiritual vessel that he has given us. The first type of heart that he talks about is a heart that is hard. He says, so woe be upon the heart that is hardened because its inability to remember God. This heart is mentioned within the context of those who fail to remember God often. For those of you who have been participating in some of the halakhas that have been doing the last couple of weeks, particularly uh, over the last month or so, where we've been taking a look at Surah Al-A'la, I mentioned to you that numerous times, last week I mentioned that last, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala numerous times mentions um, his signs established within nature as the best opportunity to return back to him. So he talks about the herbage, he talks about the trees, he talks about the stars, he talks about the ocean, he talks about the plants. And like these days, today is like a really, really nice day, not as humid or as rainy as it's been the last couple of days. When you're leaving the building today, you look up at the sunset as it's close to the time of prayers and you see how beautiful it is. And that should be a means that, rem that remind us of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's meant to do that. Whether or not that happens, that requires us to put in the effort to be more conscious or be more open, not only the sight of the eyes, but also the sight of the heart to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to see our creator in the midst of that. You follow what I'm saying? So for this type of heart that God mentions within the Quran is that their heart is so hardened via sin, via distraction from this dunya, via challenges, obstacles that they're facing in their life, whatever it might be, there is some hindrance, some blockade between them and their ability to see God within these signs of him, Asawaja. This is the first type of heart that is mentioned in the Quran. The second type is what is known as the sick heart, the ailing heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in their heart, says a sickness. And due to their own sin, due to their own transgression, God increases that illness. Now, God's not talking about cholesterol, not talking about, again, any physical heart ailment. But he's talking about, again, the consumption of vice that fills that heart that doesn't allow for it to progress the way that it ought to progress. Doesn't allow for it to grow the way that it has the potential to. But the good thing is, right, that with something that is sick and something that is ill, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also provides a cure. What was the first heart that we said? It was too hard that it could not remember God. The second, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's sick, but it's not hardened, not totally, not completely. It's not wasted, it's not lost. There's still potential there. It just needs the cure. We'll get into the cure in a moment. And then the third type of heart is that which we are seeking, or inshallah, which all of you have, maybe which I'm seeking. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, إلا من أتى الله بقلب سليم, that no one will be successful on that day, the world beyond this one, except if they approach God with a sound heart, with a clean heart, with a purified heart. And that is what we strive to, or we ought to strive to every day, every moment. Growth in this spiritual vessel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and utilizing these days and nights of the month of the Hajjah to do so, we have that opportunity to be successful. So with that, what are these steps or what is this practical 
means by which we can utilize the month and these days that are approaching us in order to actualize it. There's a beautiful hadith from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, which talks about the quality of those who are God conscious. I was reading this earlier today. I thought to share it with you all. He says about those who are God conscious, those who feel and see the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consistently, he speaks to some of their characteristics, part of a very lengthy narration where he actually mentioned upward of 150 characteristics. I just wanted to read a couple of them. He says, number one, He says that within themselves, those who are God conscious, what we're striving for, those that are God conscious, they are always at the same emotional state or they're always at the same spiritual state whether they are going through a tribulation or what, whether they're going through bad times or whether they're going through good times. You, ha- you hear really, really good news, you're thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You hear really bad news, you're patient. You don't go through these ups and downs so significantly whereby when things are going well, you forget God. And when things are going really, really bad, you turn back to God. It's really easy to do that, right? In a hadith al-Qudsi, uh, meaning hadith directly from Allah Azza wa Jal to his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, which by the way was also on your Ramadan sweatshirts, right? It said, uh, Ya Ahmed, i'raf ilayya fil-rakha, a'rifuka fil-shidda. That, oh Ahmed, remember me in the good times, and I'll remember you in the bad times, virtually. Because it's really easy to remember God when things aren't going so well, right? Someone is ill. Someone is, you know, experiencing financial hardship. Someone's gone through some relationship challenges. Someone experienced mortality. Whatever it might be, everyone turns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I read this report some, you know, months ago. It talked about the amount of people during the midst of the pandemic who searched for God, Right? Though churches and mosques and synagogues and places of worship were closed down physically, the amount of people flocking to finding resources or reading books about God, about religion, about community was more than ever before. Why? Because they felt a void and they're looking, they're going through hardship. They're looking for some hope. And of course, we know that that merciful God of ours, he offers us that sense of hope. So over here, the hadith, it says that they lower their station to their state to knowing that this good blessing that they're currently enduring is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we're thankful to God for that. But also when they're going through difficulty or hardship, they also know that it's also temporary, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will support them through the midst of the street. And he continues. أَجْسَادِهِمْ <laughs> He continues and he says that for those who are God conscious, that if it were not for the blessing of life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them, if they had the potential to leave this world, to go to the next, they would immediately like jump for that opportunity without the blinking of eye. What does that mean for just a moment? And I'll pass on to Imam Khalid after this. During these nights and days, if you guys want to move forward as well, that'd be great. During these nights and days of the month of the Hajjah, like the nights and days of the holy month of Ramadan, we have a unique opportunity. We have a unique opportunity to feel the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, unlike any other time during the course of our lives. As difficult as Ramadan is, for instance, with fasting during the day and praying during the night and limited sleep and no water and heat and all of the other things that we go through physically, go back to one moment where you felt really connected to God during the month of Ramadan. Just think about it for a moment. 
maybe during one of your own individual acts of prayer or worship, or when you were sitting with others making du'a or supplication, or when you were reciting the Qur'an, or when you were breaking fast with a friend or family member, whatever it might be. There's these moments that you wouldn't trade for anything, as difficult and as challenging as they were. And those moments, they live with you for a really long and extended period of time. If you've been to, you know, the Holy Kaaba on the days of Hajj, really on these days, I'm really, really hurt all the time. Uh, whenever I'm not in the Holy City of Mecca, because I remember those days when you glance at the Holy Kaaba. For those of you who have been, you know what I'm talking about. Go back to that moment when you first saw the Holy Kaaba, when you were in the company of the Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina. There are the moments that no matter the challenge, no matter the financial cost, no matter whatever it is, you feel something that is real, that is tangible. That moment for someone who is God conscious, who has reached this high level of ma'rifa and of understanding, they live that experience every moment of their life. And we have that opportunity right now during the course of these 10 days of the Hajjah, that if we turn our attention and have that sense of presence of heart that we talked about in the beginning to understand that this could be a springboard for our spiritual success to go back to that moment of deep khushu and connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that could be something that we utilize to sustain ourselves for the remainder of the year that could be completely transformative for a lifetime if we utilize these upcoming days and nights, if it's fasting one day during the course of these first nine days of the month of the Hijjah, as is recommended, those of you who might not be familiar, the 10th of the month of the Hijjah is the day of Eid al-Adha, where we don't fast. And the nine days preceding them are very recommended to fast. And the ninth, which is the day of Arafah, is the most encouraged and recommended to fast. Uh, and the ninth of Al-Hajjah, the day of Arafah, is also meant to be a day of worship and a day of obedience, a day of prayers, and supplication, and dhikr, and so on and so forth, days of charity during the course of these days. If we just turn our attention to doing small acts of goodness, small acts of self-improvement, be it recitation of the Quran, be it giving in charity, be it you know mending relationships with family members or friends or whatever it might be, doing something small, doing something tangible. And we say that I am working on myself, oh Allah, sincerely to turn back, to reform this heart of mine, to transition it from that sick heart to that clean heart, to elevate the station if it's already clean and already pure. When we turn our attention to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember that God is going to reciprocate that back to us. And that which we are lacking, that which we are seeking, that feeling that we are desiring or aspiring to, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, he will allow for that culmination to take place such that we gain in deep knowledge and ma'rif of him. Once we take the step, once we take the stride, once we make the commitment during the course of these nights, again, which are filled with immense blessing and immense uh, uh, reward and merit as are described within the ayat of the Quran, within the traditions of the Prophet and his family, alayhim salatu wasalam, Again, we will find ourselves filling the spiritual void. Inshallah, we will feel so connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, moving forward for the remainder of uh, remainder of these days, inshallah. So embedded in these 10 days, if you're not familiar with it, there's Quranic verse that alludes to kind of a deeper sanctification of the 10 days of the Hijjah, the first 10 days. And we'll know by... Friday, when the month of the Hijjah is going to start, right? May Allah make us from those who witness those 10 days and benefit from them. And then you have numerous hadith that talk about the unique barakah and blessing of those 10 days. The challenge that we want to be able to address is now taking what it is that we hear, what we know of text, and trying to understand what gets in the way from us implementing and acting upon what we know. So fundamentally, you have an entire month of Ramadan, 30 days, 30 nights, 
you're fasting if you have the physical means to fast and you're able to fast on those days. Some of you standing into the late hours of the night, you're in a space where volunteerism is at a high, you're connected to dua differently, but the things you're making dua for are also categorically different than the rest of the time. If you are able to just find stillness to make dua in the first place, rather than the completion of a prayer just has you get up abruptly to go elsewhere, or I might not have even prayed the prayer at all. And that's not a knock on anybody, but to be able to recognize that the inward agitation then lends itself towards an impact in terms of our worldly engagement. And Ramadan allowed for an opportunity to kind of rest and breathe. Our tradition has other moments that are built into it strategically, right? There's nothing that with is without meaning in God's plan. And so fundamentally, these 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, they also afford a certain opportunity for increased metaphysical gain, blessing, barakah. But the challenge that comes in is not just knowing, but acting upon knowing and trying to dig deep to say, why do I not yield advantage from all of these 10 days, right? The 10th day of Dhul Hijjah, is the day of Eid al-Adha, right? May Allah make it a joyous Eid for all of us. The ninth of Dhul Hijjah, the day of Arafah, the Prophet ﷺ says that Hajj Arafah, that Hajj is Arafah, right? That you have to stand in Arafah. It's from one of the foundational pillars of the Hajj. And then you have eight days prior to it that are also within those 10 days. I want you to turn to the person sitting next to you and just as vulnerable as you can, right? You're in communities, family. We care about one another. Why don't we take advantage of those first eight days or those 10 days in their entirety? What gets in the way? My own socialization, the way it was taught to me, the world, work, absence of community, the presence of West, whatever it is, but digging deep. Because if I want to get to a destination, I can't just outline where I want to land, but I want to understand what is really the obstacles that are preventing me from reaching it definitively. And it's not going to ever just be one thing, right? All of you is connected to the rest of you. And the ability to find strength and empowerment through spirituality and faith necessitates being able to bring all of you to the conversation, including the minds that you've been endowed with, to think deeply what's going to keep me from taking advantage of it. And you can think about this in a few different frames. Literally, what I will do when I get home is I'm going to write from one to 10, signifying 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, and saying, what are the things I'm hoping to do on these days? What's the day of Arafah going to look like for me? What does success look like for me in the observance of the ninth of Dhul Hijjah? What's the day of Eid going to look like for me? How do I know that it's a day that I've celebrated and commemorated in the ways that I want for it to be? But as a primary and being able to list what we want to achieve and what we want, doesn't have to be huge. And we're going to talk about it in a few minutes. You want to first think about what's going to get in the way, practically speaking, as well as beyond externals, like inwardly, what's going to keep me from taking advantage of it? Because it's defined, right? God's promise is true. It's huck. These are 10 important days. There's barakah to it. There's blessing to it. It's undoubted. That's what it is. If you believe in the barakah of Ramadan that has you stay awake till Fajr in the last 10 nights, it's the same text that's telling you that these days are also filled with blessing. What's the difference? What's going on subjectively? Do you get the question? So if you turn to the persons next to you and just talk it out for a few minutes, What's keeping us or will potentially keep us so I can anticipate it as I'm trying to plan strategically? Anybody else can relate to that? Certifications, tests, exams? Yeah. What else? No, you can't relate. You're shaking your head. <laughs> Sorry. You are on your own. <laughs> Let me tell you something that reminds me of. My son, Kareem, is six. Um, some of you have probably seen him running around here. 
and Kareem and I were laying down uh, in my bed, and there, there's a scene in Doctor Strange 2. Has anybody seen Doctor Strange 2? Yeah, you're lying. <laughs> huh? You saw it? Great. Just me and you are the only ones. <laughs> Just like she's the only one that takes exams. So there's a movie. It's called Doctor Strange 2. <laughs> and in this movie, they have uh, a character by the name of the Scarlet Witch. If you read comic books, you're probably familiar with it. Essentially, the film is premised around the idea that there's multiple universes. And so they say to her in one scene, you know, why would you need access to all of these, et cetera? And she said, because infinite numbers of universes mean that my children will always be able to access a cure. It'll be in one of these universes for whatever ailment they have. And my six-year-old, he said to me, Baba, you know, Wanda is wrong. And I said, what is she wrong about, Kareem? And he said, every illness doesn't have a cure. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, there's no cure for loneliness. <laughs> and I said to my wife, like, I don't know if I should be like, what, what is going on with our child? <laughs> that this is what he's saying to me. Six year old. He's six years old, yeah. And so I just want to be able to stress, because it'll likely come up, that a solution to a lot of what's going to be said is being able to lean on one another, right? You can have an individual journey, but we talked about this yesterday in the halakha that I do, uh, we were looking at a couple of verses of Quran, inclusive of a sirat and mustaqim. A sirat, one of its characteristics is that it's wide and spacious. Meaning even if I'm traversing it on my own unique journey, there's still room for us to kind of still walk it together. You see what I mean? And it just reminded me of what my son said. And I haven't told anybody yet. So I'm glad I got to just tell 100 people. <laughs> and that was exactly what I was hoping it would be like. What else, what else gets in the way? To drill that down, like to what is really going on there then, right? If it's optional, what does that mean? Yeah. What? That's not in response to what I just said, man. <laughs> yeah, bad habits, okay. But when you say it's optional, what's happening there then? You're getting in the way of yourself. How? Because you're not saying it's important. Okay, so your self-talk is important, right? Shifting a paradigm is not an outward exercise, it's an inward exercise. So if I tell myself it's unimportant, then I'm going to believe it's unimportant. So if I say it's just optional, that doesn't mean that the words actually are evoking what I intend for them to mean. What I'm saying is it's not important for my time. It's not worth it to me. And then you start to drill down on, well, what constitutes worth? What are you basing a sense of actual worth upon? Because your spirit, your heart, your being, your body has gone through moments in various parts of the calendar year. You've gone for Umrah, right? May Allah accept. You've gone for Hajj. It's hard to go to those places and to not feel something, right? Literally, the hadith has du'as being uttered that speak about individuals that can somehow leave Ramadan and not be forgiven in a way that says it's just improbable. How can you go into it and not take something away from it? Do you know what I'm saying? So you play a role in rendering now conviction and belief that then says, this is something that's worth it to me. It's like when people say to me, I don't have time for something, right? I don't have time to take care of my inner self. What you're really saying is, it's not important to me. And that might be something that stings a little bit. I can say it to you as somebody who, if you look at my Google calendar, you look at Sheikh Fiaz's Google calendar, you can look at some of yours. 
It's not an either or, it's a both and. You can be productive, you can have a type A personality, you can run all around and you can still have inward balance. You don't have to sacrifice that. What else? What else gets in the way? Yeah. Consciousness, stick to the bridge that our teacher is telling us. You connect this back to Ramadan that fundamentally every practice is about now a mindfulness that's not just mindfulness parallel to contemporary jargon, but ours is a mindfulness that is unique in that it roots itself in an ethical imperative. And what you do is you wake up a little bit in Ramadan. And then some days turn into weeks and turn into months. And then what shaitan's trying to get you to do is not commit haram. Everybody commits haram. It's not to be indifferent towards it. May Allah forgive us for it. But the idea is to get you to a place that dilutes vision and perspective. So you start to lose the consciousness and the awareness. You forget about your own capacity and you get back to default settings that instinctively, I'm in the same routine, going through the same anxieties, the same frustrations. I'm not able to find solutions. It's the same restlessness, the same agitation. This is a book that you have to buy into what it's saying, that some of the prescription that's there is not that you pray your pain away, but the ability to respond to pain differently comes from the engagement of these time-tested practices that will now enable the inward to reach its highest level of a celestial self. You can only get out of it what you put into it. If you're not putting in anything, then you're not going to get anything from it. You see? The day of Arafah the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, the day before Eid, if you have the ability to fast, you should fast. You fast in the same way you fast your obligatory fast of Ramadan. There's some fiqh distinctions. I don't know what it is in Jafri fiqh. In the Sunni tradition, you can make an intention for a recommended fast up until Dhuhr of that day. Doesn't mean you can eat till the her time and then say, now I'm going to fast. You can't eat. If you ate and the sun was up post fudger, then no fasting that day, right? But if you wake up late, you're a few hours in, you don't know what's going on. And you're like, oh man, somebody just told me it's Arafa. You can intend to do it by the her time. Is this similar? It's the same. But if you have an obligatory fast that has to be made up and Shia Jafri, then you have to perform the oblig obligatory fast prior to the recommended. You cannot make a recommended fast if you have a fast that needs to be made up from Ramadan, for instance. And we have different opinions on this, one of which is you can share intentions, right? So you can have it. And then the other opinion is that a fard has to be made up as a fard. And something that's recommended can only be made up. Allah knows best. But it's right? good to make the uh, the obligatory fast up on a day that's recommended to fast otherwise. So if you have a fast, instead of waiting until the winter time and say, I'm going to fast when it's only eight hours, to make it up on the day of Arafah oh, so in 100 good. degrees <laughs> is better to do. Uh, as, the, as the hadith from uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, he says, I, I love from this world three things. Rahib min dunya tarathan. I'll save I'll save them all, but one of them is a uh, for safe. I love to fast in the heat of the summer. So, so uh, may Allah make us from those who relish to fast in the summer. <laughs> but don't lose the intellect that got you to think creatively that you should fast in the winter. Also, right? You work in your capacity. So the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, it's a blessed day. It's a day you want to make du'a, right? You want to be in a state where you embody those actions. The 10th of Dhul Hijjah is the day of Eid. It's your holiday. You celebrate it. Anticipate celebration, but think about it creatively. Those two days, we will have iftar at the IC, and we will have Eid prayers and brunch, and you should come to it and bring people with you. And make dua that it doesn't rain so that we can be outside. 
Because if you were here after Ramadan, we tried to cram a lot of people indoors because of the rain. We couldn't let in a lot of people also because of that. We don't want to turn anyone away, right? So that's just a special request. Now you start to think creatively. We last week had three people take Shahada in this community. Who's going to invite them to celebrate Eid with them? Who's going to say to them, come break fast with me, right? You are. You think about it. We have a sister in our community. Her name is Shazia Maimon. She's a nurse practitioner. She started eight years ago a toy drive around this Eid in uh, local New York City hospital. 125 presents was the goal. And that year, we brought the gifts here, packaged them up one by one, and went to the hospital to give them to the kids. I don't know if you've ever been to a hospital. We go to hospitals quite often. And of the difficulty of visiting people in hospitals, visiting a child in a hospital is its own experience, right? May Allah bless you if you are a nurse, you are a doctor, a health provider of any kind, you work with these young people specifically, or even the elderly, those who are sick in their times of need, right? May Allah preserve you because it's not an easy job to deal with that day in and day out and day in and day out. You see the smiles on these kids' faces. They're celebrating a holiday in a hospital. And I want you to think about this. Because we have narrations in addition to Quranic verse to talk about the sanctity of these days, the performance of good deeds on all 10 days, but to not limit now through an air of trepidation that I walk on eggshells because I'm not comfortable in my relationship with my faith. Be strong because you believe in a God that believes in you more than you believe in yourself. And so all of the things that you do, like do the fara'id, these are not days you want to leave it behind. Engage in recommended acts of worship, du'a, do these things. Shazia, this year, her organization is doing this toy drive for the seventh time. They didn't do it one year because of COVID in 2020. So this is the seventh year, and she went from one hospital with 125 kids to this year, it's 25 different hospitals that are participating in 25 states in the country. She made it its own nonprofit. It's going to bring joy to thousands, not just kids, but can you imagine what those parents feel that somebody is thinking about me, right? There could be a masjid down the street. Nobody's thinking about these guys through this organization. They bring iftar and suhoor to parents whose children are also in the hospital. And what you're doing is not just bringing a gift or food. You're helping people to know that they're not forgotten, that somebody notices them. Now, I want you to think about this. What's going on with this person that she's able to think about the creation and establishment of good deeds in such a unique way. And what's getting in the way from you and I to think about it in a similar capacity? As you have evolution and maturation to yourself, it doesn't mean you create worship, but the ability now to respond to that organic growth necessitates being able to enhance the experience you have with the divine by tapping into that religious and spiritual experience with yourself in your entirety. And so on day one, you think about, hey, where's the soup kitchen I can go and volunteer in? On day two, you think about that there are still people who are deeply impacted from the adverse effects of a two-year pandemic that has restricted us and rent prices are still going high and people are still stuck at home with their abusers and there's kids who still can't afford electronics to carry out classes when they're still at home sick with COVID and they have to quarantine. But you have to be able to embrace the creativity and reflect on the hadith in a way, the Quran in a way, 
that says this is for me to do, not for somebody else to do. And for me to not make excuses. And so I silence the voice. I think about the unique gift that the divine has given to me. And then I shift the paradigm to say, this is an opportunity to increase my own luminosity and to go out and then share the light I'm endowed with, with others. And the impact then goes back to the heart. So all of those things that get in the way, identify which ones are internal. And then how you confront them individually. There's going to be spaces where you might be the only person doing certain things. That's hard. It's okay to say that it's hard. There's nothing that keeps you from turning to the people around you, from coming to us, saying, we know this building in the summer closes at 8 p.m. So I want to organize iftar in Central Park on the first weekend of the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. I want to invite people to come to a diner to have suhoor on the day of Arafah, right? You don't, you can do it. And you're actualizing these narrations then in those ways. Do you see what I mean? And then the impact comes back to the individual. I'm going to share one story that I think is kind of indicative of what it is that I'm talking about that I experienced when Sheikh Fiaz and I went for Hajj in 2019. Did anybody else go for Hajj in 2019? He did? Yeah, Alexa. It wasn't amazing. Yeah, it was really nice, right? I'm glad the three of us got to go. <laughs> in Hajj in 2019, it was so unique and majestic because it rained everywhere. It rained in Mecca. We were making tawaf around the Kaaba. What I learned in Jafri Fik is that if you don't make your tawaf, you can commission someone to make the tawaf for you, right? Someone if, can. If there's a reason. If there's a reason, right? Correct. So Sheikh Fiaz was doing like tawafs three. for three, three people. in one day. Yeah. Day. I came home. I came to our tent. We're in our tent in Ihram. I was like, man, I walked like 14 miles today. He was like, I walked 21 miles today. <laughs> I was like, all right. <laughs> Take a screenshot of it. <laughs> It rained in Mecca, it rained in Mina, it rained in Medina, and one of the most beautiful rains fell in Arafah, on the day of Arafah. And there was millions of us on this plane. People are engaged in conversation with one another. And you hear then this silence erupt as these rains start to fall and everyone positions themselves in the direction of the Kaaba, because nobody wants to miss that moment. And it felt like with every drop of rain that was striking the pavement, our beings, the rooftops of tents set up in this plain of Arafah, Allah was affirming the acceptance of another du'a and another du'a and another du'a. And when it was done, there was a young man in our group who said to me, hey, I'm going to go freshen up my wudu. And I went with him. And then when we were coming back from making wudu, there was an elderly man, as old as your grandfather. If you want to picture him in your head, however you know your grandfather to be, who had also just made his wudu. But as he was drying off, he removed the top part of his ihram, as well as the bottom part, hanging from a tree branch, he was completely without clothing. And just like all of you are seated here looking this way, there was crowds of people who were looking at this elderly man, old as your grandfather. Some were pointing at him and laughing. Some were making faces of disgust. Some were quite angry. And they were displaying their anger Others were angry at those that were doing these things in relation to this man. And some were just standing, staring. And the guy that was with me, he said to me, you take off the top of your ahram, I'm going to take off the top of mine. Let's go give him some privacy. 
And I made dua to Allah that, Ya Allah, give me a heart that's like this. Literally, every one of these people experienced Arafah in Ihram, in the rain, after being in these blessed cities for days. This one person saw it differently. And that's the whole point of this. The transformation is meant to be inward. But you can only yield what comes at the conclusion of an act, a spiritual exercise, through the completion of that act, or at least the undertaking and the attempt of the completion. Because ours is a God who rewards us for what we intended and attempted to do, even if we don't get to it fully as best as we thought we could. So you got to think, what am I missing out on by not bringing strategy? What is my next spiritual step? What are the spiritual gifts that I am letting go of? Do you see what I mean? And so be bold in that relationship. Think about how you can be creative in it. You have ideas. Let us know what the ideas are. You want to see something happen? Let us know what those things can be. But when these days come, you don't want to let them just pass you by. It doesn't have to be grand things. You can have exams and you can still take so much from it. But if you're in a place where your voice is telling you that there's no way that I can, then you've already given shaitan victory over your heart. You understand? Does that make sense? So I'd like for everybody to do just for a moment is to look within yourself and just think, what are you going to be celebrating on the 10th of Dhul Hijjah, the day of Eid? The achievements of the previous nine days and that day itself. What is it that those 10 days are going to look like for you? Start to think about it right now, reasonably. Who are you going to spend them with? What are the spaces you're going to go to? How are you going to orient your routine in order for you to gain from it? And is anything that comes to mind really that hard to achieve? And the difficulty, is it more rooted in something inward getting in the way or something external? As you think about that, there's one or two last things. Part of this Eid, we have a ritual slaughter, the Udhiya, the Qurbani. We're going to be running a campaign as we normally do to send that to people in need. And this year we're gonna be sending initially um, our Udhiya as a community to Sudan. They have a program where you can get your individual share allocated, but they also have a program uh, that we're working with Islamic Relief USA, it's called Qurbani Plus. It's a financial empowerment program that brings multiple livestock to families that have widows, uh, widows with children, survivors of abuse, you know, others who are in need in Sudan. The livestock is essentially given to them in a financial empowerment model that enables then them to raise it, use its milk for different reasons, whatever it is, but also to purchase back the livestock through the Udhiya campaign. And it creates then residual income for people in need. So that's the second part to it. We sent out emails today about this toy drive that I just talked to you about. We expect, inshallah, as best as you can, participate in both in whatever capacity. There's some toys on there that are less than three or four dollars, which I know for some of us, that's might not be something that we can do, but still in whatever ways that you can, you can make contributions directly on their site that are tax deductible also. And for the Udhiya, we're going to put that out in a few days. And again, whatever you can give. I've been in conflict zones. I've been in refugee camps. 
I've been in spaces where people have nothing. Some of you have seen images that I've shared of it. There were camps that I went to in the initial exodus of Rohingya refugees to Bangladesh, fleeing genocide and ethnic cleansing when the borders were first open between Myanmar and Bangladesh. The first time I went was a few days after Eid al-Adha, and the next time I went was a few days before the next Eid al-Adha. And there was refugees that I met in these camps who for 10, 11 months, all they ate every day was the same rice, three meals a day. Not one had a narrative that didn't include seeing loved ones killed in front of them in atrocious ways, burned alive, all kinds of things. A lot make it easy for them. And so many, when I asked them on that second trip, what is it that you're looking for? Again, the widows, the survivors, those who had remaining children with them, one after the next said, I really hope that I can give my child just some meat to eat on this Eid. Not because they're carnivorous or just desiring of it, these are people that ate rice every day for almost a year. But as a way to just make the day different. The relief agencies I was with, they said, whatever you do, don't tell them that we can do that for them. Because we intend to, but we are always uncertain whether Muslims are going to actually do their udhiyah or not. And on the other end of it, there's somebody who is going to receive that you might not meet. You're not just giving them food, but again, you're helping them to be remembered. Those are not du'as you want to be without, you see? There's different opinions in different schools on whether this is an obligation or a recommendation. Most would say it's a recommendation, right? Same for you all, right? But again, it's how you talk to yourself about it. Might be an option for you, if that's what you think being mustahab means, but at the end of it, there's other people who literally, globally, they will have food to eat because you do this thing, you see? And so you start to think deeply about the ritual, the practice, and what's really going into it. And then how do you encourage others towards good things? Does it make sense? Okay. We're going to wrap up here, unless there's something anybody wants to discuss, any last thoughts, comments, questions. We want to give people time to eat anything on anyone's mind. Yes. So we're, so we're planning on having a program on the day of Arafah as well. Oh, like the importance of Islam. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. Oh. I was saying that we're going to be having a halaqa on the day of Arafah as well, which we'll get into that in a lot of detail. But, uh, but briefly, the day of Arafah, as Mom Khalid mentioned earlier in a prophetic hadith, uh, that the day of Arafah is the day of Hajj, mm -hmm. meaning that that day is the most significant day for the pilgrims who perform the mm -hmm. pilgrimage in and of itself. Day of Arafah is uh, known as Arafah, which is the root word for Arafah, which is to know. Uh, and it's an opportunity for us to fast during the course of the day, hopefully, that we are able to uncover a little bit about ourself, uh, ideally. So during the course of that day, or during the course of the days leading up to it, are this opportunity for us to do these little things, perform acts of ritual, uh, via prayer and supplication and worship and so on, such that we're able to maximize that day in full exertion in the same way that we plan the entirety of the month of Ramadan, looking to those last 10 nights of the month of Ramadan, where you really want to focus you, and, and be attentive and diligent in your obedience. That would be the climax of the course of these uh, 10 days. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I, I meant to just say that we were going to be having this halakha, so please do join us on that day. Uh, and, and just one other point to add over here is that we talk about religious ritual like that of fasting and like that of prayers and, and so on. Remember that these are all a means to an end. They're not the end in and of itself. It is a means to not only improve yourself, but to make this communal impact that we're talking about. There are millions, billions, you know, of Muslims generation after generation 
who have engaged in personal worship, but that hasn't led to any tangible change. You know, if you read books by anybody, one of their biggest criticisms amongst Muslims and non-Muslims of Muslims and Islam is that religious ritual is so important and significant to them, but it doesn't necessarily transcend into anything beyond, which is so opposite of the life and the legacy of our Prophet He utilizes his prayer and his relationship with God to be someone who makes a difference in community. So when we talk about, you know, uh, fast on the day of Arafah, but also, you know, contribute or, or perform an obhiya, uh, sacrifice of an animal and distribute that, it's not... It, it shouldn't be that I will do one and I won't do the other. The fast and the prayer and the worship is supposed to give us that desire to do that because we care for other people. Fasting and praying and worship and religious services and sitting in sermons or halakhas, whatever, is meant to give us the inspiration to make that payment so I can buy these toys to give to these children in these hospitals. It's not I'm going to do one or the other. You follow what I'm saying? individual relationship between us and God is supposed to create communal impact. So carry that on, you know, with you, not only in the month of the Hajjah or the month of Ramadan, remember that if I'm praying and I'm worshiping, and then I go back to my work and my life and my family, and I don't have no care for anything outside of my internal circle, well, then maybe my, maybe I need to reevaluate or look internally with what my prayer is all about in the first place. If that makes sense. Okay. Um, Zakla, I 